Hello and good afternoon and morning to everyone. Um, I'm Liz Hagen, Director of Policy Solutions at United States of Care. We're a nonpartisan, non nonprofit organization committed to ensuring that everyone has access to quality, affordable health care. Thank you for joining us today in what is going to for sure be a very thought provoking conversation about the unwinding of the public health emergency. We're so thrilled today to welcome you as we speak with leading experts from Massachusetts, Oregon, Rhode Island, and Sofian on how they're approaching the public health emergency unwinding and what the implications of this will be on real people and real communities. I also wanna thank our trusted partner and co-host Sofian for collaborating with us to bring together this webinar. Rob, Josh, and team, we're so grateful for your expertise and leadership in this space. Uh, we'll dig into things in just a minute, but first I wanted to share a little bit more about United States of Care and the issue that we're talking about today. As I said, our mission is to ensure that everyone has access to quality, affordable health care, regardless of health status, social need, or income. And we center people and the health care needs that they have in all that we do. So we bring together people from all sides of health care, including leaders from the private and public sectors, as well as patients, caregivers, and others to forge new health care solutions. And for the last two years, we've spoken to thousands of people throughout the country and every state about their feelings and experiences with our current healthcare system to better understand where people are and what changes they wanna see. And we're harnessing those lessons to drive policy change that reflects those needs. Through our research and engagement, we've learned that cost is people's foremost concern. People's most urgent need is that they can afford their healthcare. Unfortunately, it's the reality in this country that people fear that accessing health care will lead to financial ruin, bankruptcy, or debt. Our conversations and research have also made it clear that people really value dependable coverage that provides security and freedom through life's changes. We consistently hear stories of people fearing that their insurance, uh, that moving or changing jobs, having a baby, getting injured, or growing older, or any number of other life changes means that they could lose their health insurance. And if people lose their coverage, they lose the security that comes with it when they need the care the most. In addition to lowering cost and dependable coverage, people have also told us that they want a system that is personalizable, where they can get care when they need it and how they want it, and that they also can have an understandable and easy to navigate system. This is all really helpful context for why we're here today. The continuous coverage provisions in the Family First Coronavirus Response Act have meant that people can stay enrolled in Medicaid for the duration of the public health emergency, providing them with that dependable and affordable coverage that they need and want. These provisions have allowed millions of people to stay on coverage without any interruption, which is partially why we've seen the uninsured rate not increase like we typically would see when people experience such levels of job loss, changes income, and change in financial status and more. In fact, estimates show that we're seeing some of the lowest uninsured rates ever recorded. But the public health emergency eventually will end, and the latest update is that it will end in October unless there's another extension, which we all know is very possible. Once it ends, states will have up to a year to redetermine people's eligibility for Medicaid. Estimates show that roughly 15 million people, including 7 million children, will likely no longer be eligible for Medicaid once this happens. In the worst case scenario, this means that people will go uninsured. And the outcome we all wanna see is that people will transition to other coverage, including through their marketplace. We all know that a related issue is the advocacy going on to extend the American Rescue Plan Act subsidies that make coverage more affordable for people purchasing marketplace coverage. All of the states on our panel today recently signed on to a letter with other marketplace directors asking Congress to extend those subsidies since they're set to expire at the end of the year. Without an extension, people who are no longer eligible for Medicaid could face unaffordable premiums on the marketplace that make them less likely to enroll. We know how important these subsidies have been and appreciate the continued advocacy for their extension from partners across the country. This is all, as you can imagine, a big undertaking for states and one that we want to make sure is seamless for people to navigate. We know that states are working tirelessly to make that a reality from figuring out automated processes of enrollment to figuring out and developing targeted approaches to outreach. And we'll hear more from our speakers about their approaches shortly. First though, I wanted to hand it over to Rob for opening remarks from the Safdian side before we uh, hear from our talented list of our talented panelists of speakers. Rob. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Liz. So, and, and welcome to our panelists here uh, with us today. 
Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rob Miller. I'm the, the general manager of Softion's government uh, solutions team. I've had the uh, awesome opportunity to be with Softion for 15 years and be a major part of the implementation of ACA from you know legislation back in 2009 to, to today. This particular webinar is really near and dear to my heart um, because you know, Softion, myself, and really a lot of the wonderful colleagues that I work with, you know, including at Softion and our customers, really believe in that mission um, to make healthcare affordable, accessible, and plentiful, as we call it, right? Very similar to, to US of care as well. And I think the challenges that we wanted to talk today really hone in on that sort of accessibility and of, of coverage. Um, and I think healthcare is really confusing. Um, and I think while it may be at the top of our minds, uh, every day. Um, it's not necessarily the top of the minds of each consumer. They have certainly a lot more to worry about than trying to figure out this complex uh, system. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about how the different states are approaching sort of the avalanche of Americans who may be dropped uh, from Medicaid and what we can do to help maintain continuity coverage in, in either ACA or really any other types of coverage that, that may be uh, available to consumers. So for those of you who don't know uh, Softion, uh, just a quick you know, plug for us. Uh, we're a vertically integrated solution that supports uh, ACA, the Medicaid, and Medicare markets uh, through our minor aligned microservices architecture. We have a lot of experience, significant amount of experience leading the ACA market where we support both state-based marketplaces and a countless number of health plans, including you know, CVS Aetna, Centene, AmeriHealth, and many different blues. Uh, in addition, we also support six states in eligibility determinations and program integrity. Our Verify solution um, essentially acts as the glue between the MMIS platforms and the outside data sources that support asset verification, income and employment checks, identity proofing, incarceration, and a whole slew of other private and public data sources. Um, many states are asking us how we can assist them in the, in the public health emergency wind down and find the most efficient way to keep those consumers enrolled in parallel to identifying those who are likely no longer eligible for Medicaid through these different data points and other social determinants of health. And I think sort of our, our work in the Medicaid and ACA space puts us in a unique position to try to help tie these two different things uh, together. Um, so as Liz mentioned, we're really excited uh, for this conversation and uh, we definitely encourage our attendees to submit um, questions. And I guess uh, without further ado, I will pass the virtual mic back to you, Liz, to uh, introduce our panelists, get us started. Thanks, Rob. Um, our panelists can uh, uh, join now on, uh, on video. Um, so first I'd like to introduce uh, Cheeky Flowers, who's the administrator from the Oregon Health Insurance Marketplace, the state's health insurance exchange. Um, Marissa Woltman, who is the senior director of policy and applied research at Massachusetts Health Connector, their state's exchange and Lindsay Lang, who's director of Health Source Rhode Island, Rhode Island's exchange. And lastly, we have Josh Schultz, who's a senior policy analyst at Softion. So with that, I'd love to jump into our discussion and I can kick us off. And as Rob mentioned, please, as the audience, um, please feel free to uh, add questions into the chat box. We're gonna have a really good discussion here, but save time for at the end to, to take audience questions and we'd love to incorporate those. Um, so I will first kick us off um, and maybe just ask a sort of broad question that I think everyone is probably thinking, um, which is to tell us more about how you're approaching the public health emergency unwinding, what initiatives or approaches you're putting into place to ensure a smooth transition and sort of what your key priorities are. And uh, Josh, we can start with you. Josh, I think you're on mute. All right. Thanks, Liz. Uh, glad to be here today. Um, so I'll start. Uh, one big challenge that we're seeing is finding and effectively using accurate contact information for Medicaid enrollees. We're seeing a lot of states concerned that they don't have correct contact information to start the Medicaid reassessment process. And this problem isn't exclusive for government agencies as we're seeing health plans, carriers struggling with the same issue. Relocations reached a peak during COVID-19, and the continuous coverage requirement means that a lot of old information is now out of date. Um, similarly, with connections to credit bureaus and data providers, we're working to get the right information available to make sure that carriers and states are making the best use of their time. For example, we can identify if someone has moved to another state through our data partners. 
Um, we also want to make to take steps to ensure a smooth transition for people who are leaving Medicaid coverage and moving to the marketplace. Timely, consistent, and simple correspondence explaining member options is needed to prevent gaps in coverage. Um, another another item is ongoing population oversight, um, something that states need to do more. Um, when somebody moves or you know goes into a you know, moves to a different state, they shouldn't wait for the next quarter or next year after that happens to pursue a redetermination. That's for me. Cheeky, we'd love to hear, hear how Oregon is, is approaching this and what some of your priorities are before moving on to the other speakers. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thanks, Liz. So like what Josh said, um, one of our pre uh, public health and winding approaches right now and priorities is of course making sure that all our members have we have the co correct contact information for them. So in Oregon, uh, our estimates, um, we have 1.4 million Oregonians that will go through the Medicaid redeterminations process. Most of them hopefully will go through the auto uh, enrollment renewal process and that's where the um, current contact information will be very, very helpful. And then for the rest, there is about um, an estimate of about, of about 300,000 Oregonians who will no longer be eligible for the Oregon Health Plan or yeah. Medicaid for us over here. Um, all 300,000 votes, are they eligible for the marketplace? We don't know yet. So once we start the Medicaid redetermination process, of course, we'll find out who already has um, employee sponsored coverage and other types of coverage. And of course, in Oregon, we're trying to, um, we're, we're going to use as much of the federal flexibilities that are available to us. So we're going to use the full 14 months to run through all the Medicaid redeterminations that we will need to do. So we'll divide the 1.4 million um, number divided by 12 and then use them the rest of the time to make sure we transition folks as easily as we can for those that need to transition out of the Oregon Health Plan. In Oregon too, we are working towards um, developing a bridge health program for those that are 138 to 200% of the federal poverty level that is still very much in development. And while we are working towards that, we are also working towards a 1115 waiver, a temporary Medicaid waiver program so that we can keep folks in Medicaid as long as we can. And then hopefully by that time, we'll have the bridge health, program, uh, bridge health care program up and running. And for those, of course, that we need to transition over to the marketplace, it'll be a significant targeted uh, outreach and education marketing enrollment assistance campaign. And Marissa, can you speak a little bit to how Massachusetts is thinking about this? Sure, happy to. Thank you for having me today. Um, so we're working really closely with our Medicaid colleagues um, who are doing a lot of really fantastic work to prepare. Um, and as the exchange, we're focusing on a few key areas. Um, so we're looking at designing clear, consistent, and effective messaging about the availability of affordable coverage for people who do transition off of Medicaid. Um, we're working on making sure that we have the operational capacity for the volume um, that we would expect and looking at ways that we can reduce administrative barriers to coverage to help people in that transition process um, and make it as smooth as possible. So um, on the messaging front, we have recently conducted some focus groups to test out some messages and to hear from people um, how they interpret what we're saying about what they need to do and how all that would work. Um, and then once we get those findings, we'll use that information to create toolkits so that everyone's really, um, you know, singing from the same song sheet or so to speak, um, and that people are getting the same message no matter where they're coming from. Um, on capacity, we're of course working closely with our call center vendor um, and trying to in increase the number of channels we have with text, email, um, live chat and chat bot, um, and then, working with our navigators and other consumer assisters and our health plans to make sure um, that everybody has the staff they need to be responsive. And then on the simplifying enrollment front, um, we've recently launched an automatic enrollment feature for people who qualify for a $0 plan under our state subsidy program. Um, and we've done some things like widening the allowable variance between what someone says their income is and the data we get back um, from our, our data sources. Um, and we're thinking about things like special enrollment periods and being able to extend those so that people have more time to make their decisions and transition into coverage. So um, that's it kind of in broad strokes, the big buckets that we're looking at. Great, and last but not least, Lindsay. 
Sure. Thank you for having me. Um, it's great to, to be here with um, my colleagues and to talk about this really important topic. Um, in Rhode Island, we have been, been we have been planning for this um, as I'm sure all of all of us have for several months. Um, our key objectives include returning, of course, to normal operations, um, minimizing the impact to customers as much as possible, and that consistent, clear communication from start to finish. Um, we are also concerned about capacity um, and recognize that we really need to leverage all of our service channels to the greatest extent possible and where it's appropriate push consumers into those supportive channels so in rhode island um, we rolled out a mobile app during the pandemic we're looking to add some functionality there to support um, consumers who need to upload a document or um, can check their status of their application or the verification of something that they're waiting on. We recognize that a lot of calls are driven by those that sort of, I'm just checking in, I want to make sure my document has been received, where is it in process? So we're trying to go sort of end to end in a lot of those processes and identify where we might be able to alleviate call volume and offer other service channels like the mobile app. Um, we are also hoping to use the mobile app to push out key messages. Um, so just using that as another way to be touching people at the right time with the right call to action um, and, and in timely ways. Um, we're also likely to rely a little bit more on our web chat service. That's something we introduced in 2019, and I think the volume's quadrupled since then. It's a more efficient um, service channel for us. The, the length of time um, is reduced from your average call, so we think that's a great um, channel to rely on. And then we're also looking at... Um, uh, how we can support folks coming off of Medicaid who are eligible on the exchange with our auto enrollment proposal. And we're going to target that at the lowest income enrollees who are going to be coming onto the exchange. Um, and we can talk a little bit, a bit more about that as we get into it today. But um, yeah, just like my colleagues, um, really looking to have that clear, consistent, uniform communication um, and then disperse the volume as much as possible and be ready um, to support customers through this transition. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, so I had, a, I had a question and maybe it's a little bit digging a little bit deeper into a little bit of what we just talked about. So, you know, we have the state-based marketplaces, many of which have an integrated eligibility system like Massachusetts, you know, Rhode Island as well. Um, and then we have states like Oregon, right? And there's more of a shared platform with, with healthcare.gov. Each system is, is, you know, fairly unique, which I suspect means that each state will be taking potentially different, pro you know, approaches to the ending of the public health emergency. Um, and Marissa, you spoke a little bit about this from a, an automation standpoint for the sort of like fully subsidized, you know, population. I'm curious if there's, you know, what other mechanisms there might be putting in place to facilitate that enrollment, maybe even if it's a more automated fashion like Marissa spoke to, um, into the ACA, um, either as, you know, as a state-based marketplace. And I'm, I'm also really curious, Cheeky, on how that might work with the federal marketplace and, you know, if CMS is helping you guys with uh, some of that messaging as well. So um, maybe we'll start with you, Cheeky, if you don't mind. I do not mind at all. So as a state agency, the Oregon Health Insurance Marketplace is not able to enroll consumers directly or automatically roll people over to private coverage when losing Oregon Health Plan benefits to healthcare.gov. So um, the Oregon Marketplace will be doing manual research, communication, and outreach to consumers losing Medicaid benefits. Um, we will be referring to uh, local community partner organizations who, uh, and, and insurance agents, of course, who assist with marketplace applications and for local one-on-one -on -one assistance. Um, so we are looking for various strategies where, of course, we will, um, we're not, we cannot crosswalk or directly map folks, but we can provide um, advice on what potential plans that could work best for them. So, in, for example, in, in local counties, um, the lowest cost over plan, or maybe the cheapest uh, the, the cheapest plan in their area. And we're also looking to hopefully be able to, to map um, their providers from their Oregon Health Plan um, plan 
uh, to the nearest qualified health plan that has their provider, their favorite provider. So we're looking at various different ways, of course, to hopefully uh, the continuity of coverage will be there for the member and provide them that, um, that information that they will need to choose the best plan that fits their needs. And of course, we will also have a call center um, that will be available to help people understand, as I mentioned earlier, what options are available to them and to refer to the local health coverage experts for assistance. So we are working with healthcare.gov. There's only so much we can do. They have their, their, um, they have their enrollment and eligibility engine that's available for all the states using FFM, using, using the FFM and of course our call, call center will be available as well. But we're also going to be providing local assistance to Oregon who need a little bit more aside from what healthcare.gov can offer them. That, that's great. Yeah, I think the, the local, you know, navigators, things like that can definitely play a big, big role here. Um, Marissa, anything else you'd want to add? I really, I really love the way that you guys have done some of these things with, you know, with the, the state wrap program and, and other things like that. What about the other, you know, folks? What's, is there anything sort of innovative or um, sort of mechanisms in place to enroll? those or is that going to be more about you know communicating that out and trying to give them as much information as they can to sort of take that step to come you know come to the exchange and and potentially enroll so i can jump in in rhode island yep. um i mentioned the auto enrollment proposal so um that is uh a concept where we would like to um support folks rolling off of Medicaid who are eligible for exchange coverage, we do have an integrated eligibility system, which will enable that sort of smooth transition. But we're also talking about plan mapping them. Um, so last year, as we were thinking ahead to how we can smooth this transition and reduce the impact to customers, really take away that administrative burden and help with costs. What we came up with is the idea of mapping our, um, our uh, consumers who are coming onto the exchange. We'll put them in the second lowest cost silver plan um, uh, offered on the exchange and, um, and pay for their first month's premium just to ensure that on day one that they don't have that Medicaid coverage, they are effectuated on the exchange. I mentioned we're tailoring that to those 200% FPL and below. Um, that works for a couple of reasons, namely that they're eligible, you know, their tax credit eligibility at that point is maximal. Um, they are eligible for cost sharing reductions. It also makes sense in Rhode Island because our majority share MCO carrier happens to also be our second lowest plan carrier for QHP. And so as we are thinking about, you know, that transition and how to keep things as um, consistent as possible, that was a real advantage of this proposal. Um, fortunately, our General Assembly did um, accept that proposal. They passed it as part of our fiscal 23 budget and actually increased the appropriation. So we may end up being in a position where we can um, offer that premium assistance for two or, or maybe even more months. Um, we're looking at that now. I think another thing that we can do as an IES um, is leverage the data that we have available. We're going to be creating an integrated dashboard in Rhode Island so that um, is, which is something we typically have, but really trying to expand it to make sure that we have line of sight into, you know, who was passively renewed, um, taking folks who are auto enrolled as part of our proposal, watching the retention over time, and then mm -hmm. for folks who are over 200 FPL, um, seeing who has come over to the exchange, maybe created an account, and following them through the entire waterfall. So have they gone through eligibility determination? Have they gone through plan selection? Um, have they enrolled? Ha, you know, do they just need to make a payment? And using that data to inform a really targeted outreach and communication strategy segmented um, at each uh, phase along that waterfall effect. So that's that's something that an IES state uh, really has working in its advantage. That's great. And then you have the sort of the sounds like the carrier, you know, buy in um, perhaps uh, as well. So that's that's really that's really great. Marissa, any other you know thoughts or comments before we may, maybe move to the next uh, question? The thing that I think I'd add is um, our Medicaid agency took a look to see how many 
households had online accounts to engage in self-service and they found that it was far more likely that, that a QHP household within our system or even a household that was a mixed QHP and Medicaid household had one of these online accounts relative to Medicaid only households. And so they've been working to get the word out about this opportunity for people and to show them how they can link their existing application with their email to be able to log in and manage their information on their own, which I think lets people take advantage of a lot of these really nice streamlined self-service opportunities that we've been working on designing. And so um, I think that that is challenging work, but definitely worthwhile work to help people take advantage of everything we can offer. Great. And maybe this is a, a, a level deeper on some of these. I think this is this has been really helpful, even hearing some of what you're saying about uh, the number of people with online apps, for example. Um, what are some other lessons learned from the public health emergency sort of coverage protections? And what does that mean for how your state might be thinking about future coverage, future coverage expansions and that sort of thing. I think one thing that's very evident, as I mentioned at the outset is, you know, the uninsured rate is incredibly low. Um, and that's a great thing. And I think something that we all here really wanna see continued. Um, but what are some of the things that, uh, some lessons learned from your state that you've learned over the past few years? And we can just open it up for whoever has, <laughs> whoever has the best idea. I don't know if this is the best idea, but I know it's, you know, it's already emerged as a theme. Um, and it was certainly in our thinking behind the auto enrollment proposal in Rhode Island, which is, you know, if you factor in for cost and you factor in for lowering the administrative burden, you know, but underneath that people do want to be covered. Um, and if you can plan for those things and and reduce that burden um people will get and stay covered in rhode island we just um completed our biannual health insurance survey and for the first time in rhode island we've dipped below three percent uninsured rate so we can see that you know the evidence is there um that when you make it easier for people um and you make it truly accessible you know, you can get there. I totally agree with that. Um, and to that end, uh, we recently put forward a request for responses to find a vendor to help us conduct an administrative burdens audit and take a really close look at our eligibility and enrollment processes to understand best practices from, from our peers in other states or private industry, um, as well as opportunities of flexibility um, that are maybe available through the federal rules that we haven't yet taken advantage of, but could um, in order to help kind of smooth that transition process from eligibility to enrollment um, as much as possible. Because I think we've seen that too, you know, when you take away these administrative requirements, it just makes it so much easier for people to get and keep their coverage. But if I can serve that motion, in Oregon, our uninsured rate went from 93% to 96%. So between the exchange auto enrollment function and uh, the continu continuous coverage for Medicaid, it really goes to show, right, if you're happy with your health insurance coverage, if you can stay on that and have a higher likelihood that folks will stay covered. So between that and I believe our Medicaid program, I, I apologize, I don't know the specifics of this, there are certain verifications that they allowed verbal attestation for. So I, I think that's truly helpful uh, lowering the administrative burden, especially for those or for our underserved populations who may not have access to their documents easily or easily able to, uh, to transmit those documents to us. Um, so uh, after that, of course, the other learning is, of course, making sure that we have up-to-date information and update that hopefully every few months or even on an annual basis so that, you know, not to go to for a very long period of time without having their, their most current um, information. We can we always try, um, but again, lower, hopefully finding a way to lower the burden to update their, their email addresses, their cell phones, their cell phone numbers, their mailing addresses, especially if it's a very transient uh, population. So again, to Marissa's point, to lower administrative, administrative burden to sign up and stay in coverage through the Oregon Health Plan or through the exchange. Yeah, thanks, Jay. And that's definitely a challenge I think a lot of states are having. I know that's why we've often been asked, you know, we connect to a lot of the larger, you know, credit bureaus, Equifax, TransUnion, you know, LexisNexis, a good partner of ours too. And 
the data is out there. I think the the challenge is obviously getting the right data and the most accurate you know data to help that process so that you don't put a lot of that burden on the actual you know consumer. Like I said, who's probably healthcare getting coverage is probably not their number one challenge that they're uh, thinking of at the moment. So thanks for that feedback. So I'm curious if any of our um, panelists have seen any uh, surprising trends uh, during the pandemic or maybe some interesting innovations that took off over the last couple of years or even maybe expected over the next um, couple of years in terms of keeping people you know, covered or helping to drive down you know, those costs. Like Liz said, I'll, I'll open it up for anybody that wants to, to jump in. I can jump in. Um, obviously, the one trend that we're seeing right now is that health plans cost much less thanks to the ARP subsidy enhancements. Um, many more people can find an affordable plan than before the ARP subsidies went into effect. And hopefully these will be extended um, and continue into the 2023 plan year. I know that we all um, we all feel that way. Um, Another trend that we're looking at is states adopting state-based marketplaces such as Maine and Virginia. And then finally, another trend we're seeing is carriers doing more with member data to improve enrollment and retention rates, um, identifying members in need of an intervention and identifying subgroups, um, allowing people to have a customized approach to outreach to at-risk members. Those are a couple of things that we've, we've seen. Yeah, and Josh, just building on that first point that you mm -hmm. made, it, I think um, at the SBM level, what we're also seeing is not just greater affordability in terms of premium, but also in terms of out-of-pocket expenses as yeah. folks have realized that with that additional subsidization, they're able to migrate up to a gold plan, a platinum plan, um, and then benefit from greater protections in terms of those out-of-pocket expenses. In Rhode Island, we saw the gold, um, our gold enrollment increased by about 16% and our platinum enrollment, which admittedly was relatively low, um, doubled from previous levels. So we saw that um, consumers were not just um, getting and staying covered with that additional assistance, but learning that they could buy into greater protection. Excellent. That's interesting that you guys had a, a platinum carrier too. Yeah. So in Oregon, what was very surprising for us over in the exchange was that our enrollment increased year over year during the pandemic years, if you will, even with a continuous coverage in Medicaid. So it is, mm -hmm truly showed for us numbers wise that so that we're going into revaluing health insurance and that was reinforced by the recent focus group discussions we did that we're going into know why they need health insurance and value health insurance it's a matter of how right how how to how to get it how to get the best price what's the best plan for them so i think the why health insurance question is no longer the main topic for us it's the how and the cost and uh, you know like um how to get it how, how to get into it and really maximize the benefits that you get from whether you're in medicaid or the exchange plan um i think the other trend that i love seeing is of course um we had to change our outreach and education and enrollment assistance tactics right we used to be able to do a lot more in-person work pre-pandemic years um and then during the pandemic years we, we rapidly had to switch to a virtual environment um I was, we were a little worried, of course, that that would take some time for our consumers, our customers to adapt to. Um, but fortunately, that was not the case. So I think that was another surprising trend, if you will, or practice that folks, well, of course, maybe they didn't have a choice, but they also still valued local assistance, whether they got it in person or virtually. One trend that we've been really excited to see throughout the course of the last few years is um, the implementation of state subsidy level pro programs at the state level um, in a variety of states. So we've had a longstanding state subsidy program, um, but it's been really great to see the creative approaches other states are taking, um, both kind of broad-based as well as targeted. Some of the work Maryland's done on young adults or Washington on childcare workers, uh, but everybody has been doing a lot of really innovative thinking in that space. 
um, to make coverage more affordable for people who need it. That's awesome. Um, and so, uh, and actually quick, I'll just know we're seeing some great questions come in. Please keep them coming. We'd love to use the, the time at the end uh, to, to cover some of them. So just a quick, quick shout out there. Um, I sort of mentioned this a little bit at the, the top, but you know, I think all of us would agree that healthcare is, is pretty confusing. And I, and I think we're all working on trying to make that easier uh, for consumers. And we know many, I would think many Medicaid enrollees are probably not even aware of the public health emergency, the fact that it might end as soon as October. Again, we breathe this stuff every single day. So it's always top of mind, but we know there's different communications that come from, you know, from the Medicaid agencies, the exchanges, which I think may even lead to further, you know, confusion. So I was curious how how thought, how folks are thinking about sort of outreach and enrollment. Um, I think uh, Cheeky, you mentioned this a little bit. Do you see a role for other stakeholders like community organiz organizations um, or even health plans or even you know private entities um, like Softion uh, to help make sure that consumers are uh, educated and stay you know enrolled uh, in coverage. So Chica, maybe I'll start with you since you mentioned a little bit about the navigators, which I think is interesting. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, sure. So as it relates to the public health emergency and winding, and um, our con we partner with community-based organizations that truly have deep roots, roots in the community. And our um, partnership with them isn't just like during the open enrollment season. It's year round. We, we share information with them as often as we can. We have regular touch bases so that they know information as we know them, right? So it, it's, they have real time information that they can act on it. Um, and we're out in the field a lot, really working with the partners and really meeting the community where they're at, giving them uh, information whether it's a public health emergency in Wyoming, a special enrollment period that maybe they may be eligible for, even COBRA versus marketplace coverage if you lose your job. So we cover a variety of different topics. So we're, we're never not in the field, whether in person or virtually, if you will. So um, as we head towards the public health emergency and winding, of course, um, we will be um, sharing grants as well to our insurance agents and community partners so that they have the resources they need to really um, enroll folks as, as many as, as many as, a given, as any given time. This 1.4 million Oregonians is a lot of people that we will need to work with. Um, so I think that's high level of what we're trying to do, um, aside from, of course, targeted advertising in different languages, um, educational materials, school flyers, so we send out backpack mailers. Think, think of anything and everything we do the best that we can to reach the community where they're at. I know I, I could go on and on about outreach, outreach and education. This is a very um, special uh, passion of mine, but let me stop there and let me see if I was responsive to your question. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, yeah, to your point, I mean, I mean, anybody that's willing to help, you know, with the mission and the cause, right, if we can bring them into the fold. And like you said, it's great that you guys are even providing grants, because that helps, you know, um, to sort of uh, cover some of the expenses they might sort of incur. So that's, that's really, that's really great. Um, Marissa, I know you guys are doing a lot of really interesting things, too. I mean, even outside of public health emergency, this is, I know, is always a sort of a big thing that the connector is, is doing, you know, driving that, that in the uninsured rate and Massachusetts is, has been amazing um, for many years, but any other thoughts on the same same question? Yep, so our state legislature awarded a local advocacy organization, Healthcare for All, $5 million in ARPA funding to um, conduct an outreach campaign related to the end of the public health emergency. And so we've been working closely with them and with our Medicaid agency um, to coordinate our efforts and resources to have a maximum impact, kind of playing to everybody's strengths, um, but looking at doing a door knocking campaign um, with that money. And then they would also be looking at doing some targeted media buys. Um, we've had really great success as an exchange in past years, um, working very closely with um, particular communities in different regions of the states and finding that kind of trusted community partner or media outlet um, that reaches a lot of people who need to hear our message in in the language that they need to hear it and from from a, a trusted delivery source that they would rely on. Um, so we'll definitely be reprising that strategy in conjunction um, with our healthcare for all and Medicaid partners, um, which is really exciting. That's great. And and Lindsay, any other any thoughts there? I know you guys are doing some really great. Sort of innovative ideas it's probably in line too but anything else that you'd like to add to that 
Um, yeah, I think pretty similar themes in Rhode Island. We, um, our Medicaid agency also was able to request some communications money um, to make sure that we can really have that broad-based messaging, earned media, um, having a presence in uh, all of our neighborhoods. We're gonna be doing outreach with our municipal leaders, our legislators. Um, Rhode Island is a small state. We have 39 towns and communities. So it is very um, achievable for us to have a presence in every community through those channels, as well as our navigator um, awardees. Um, and then uh, continuing our virtual town halls, Cheeky mentioned that as a really successful way to stay connected and, and accessible um, during the pandemic. And I think that's something that will continue into the future, uh, just as we think about ways to be just a universally accessible to uh, customers who are used to dealing with us and, and those who are less so and, and need a hand in understanding their options. Great, and I think we have maybe one more question before going to the to the audience questions. And I encourage uh, you all listening in to continue adding questions, which I hope we have time to get to all of them. Um, so in thinking, I think, and Rob, you said this well, this is I think an all hands on deck um, situation where I think we all can play a role in making sure that people are aware of their options or aware of what's kind of coming for them and, and where they can go for help. Um, for uh, what advice do you have for those uh, of us listening or for how advocates, stakeholders, or really any partner can constructively sort of help your efforts and what you're doing? Um, I think a lot of the outreach and education um, certainly comes to mind, but what other things can we be thinking about in this space to help make sure that people uh, can keep, keep, keep covered? So I'll jump in, of course, um, if we lose American Rescue Plan Act provisions, that will dramatically impact the monthly premium costs for the people enrolled through the marketplace or even potentially eligible moving away from the Oregon Health Plan. I, I know I'm preaching to the choir, um, but losing that will, will I am running out of the right adjectives. I, I, we've tried different adjectives to best describe the potential. It could be catastrophic, really it could be. Um, that's a lot of um, help, financial help that Americans have been able to access. And we already know that healthcare is confusing, healthcare is expensive, expensive. It is, an, it is an administrative burden, right? If you can't afford a quote unquote, it's a burden. If you can't afford the monthly premiums in your list of priorities, and Oregonians especially might not value health insurance in terms of the, the, the prioritization of the things they need to pay for on a monthly basis. So um, that's kind of top of mind for me. Yeah, I, I will just echo that. Without that assistance, it's an entirely different ballgame for an, anyone and everyone who cares about keeping people connected to health coverage. I think it's also really important to continue these conversations about how to support churn, how we can continue to support the pathway from Medicaid to the exchange and vice versa. It's definitely a two-way street. It's not something that I think anyone has really solved for um, definitively. And so if we can keep these types of conversations going and these innovations so that beyond the unwinding, we do have an improved pathway and support for folks who come back and forth between the two programs. Um, I think, um, you know, partners can definitely be communicating broad um, broad messages about updating contact information and making sure that your state knows how to share important information about staying covered with, with you. Watch the mail for important information. Those types of like high level messages will be really helpful once your state exchange and your Medicaid program are ready to start communicating. And I think um, something that we haven't had to think about in a while is just continuing to raise the overall profile of the marketplaces within the state. I think something that we're a little concerned about in Rhode Island is um, how familiar uh, Medicaid enrollees may or may not be with the exchange as an option that is applicable to them and that it is literally more affordable than it has ever been before. And that, you know, perhaps if they looked before um, and didn't feel like it was accessible, they should look again. And again, that's contingent upon those enhanced subsidies remaining in place, but continuing to get out the message that there is a marketplace 
um, and that there are affordable options and that you are likely eligible for them will be really helpful. Yep, definitely a third for continued um, ARP subsidies. Um, and also it's always a great time to update your application, um, whether it's just contact information or a job change, um, having the latest and greatest information available in your application, I think is um, really essential to smoothing the process of renewal once it does begin. And so there's no really, um, you know, you don't have to wait for that renewal to come in the mail, going in and making those updates either through self-service or calling. Um, and just making sure that everything is squared away as, as much as it can be right now is really, really helpful. I just wanted to add that there are, throughout this whole Medicaid unwinding process, there are also private vendors like Sophion that are, you know, can and are willing to help with, you know, the process of, um, of connecting former Medicaid enrollees to exchange coverage. Um, in the context where there is a role available to be played. And so we are very happy to potentially play that role um, and are eager to, um, to continue to communicate with everyone about that. Thank you. Great. And I am seeing a lot of really good questions. So I'm going to try to, um, in real time, prioritize which ones uh, we want to get to. Um, we actually got a couple questions um, that kind of fit into some buckets. So I try to combine some of them. Um, we got a question about um, the focus groups and messaging, Marissa, that you mentioned um, taking place in Massachusetts. And I think that question actually came in before Cheeky, you mentioned that you also did some um, messaging research in Oregon. Um, I think people are very interested in seeing this in particular for states that might not have the same resources to be able to um, do that themselves. And I also know that states have to tailor the messages to what works for their state, but there's probably some common themes. Um, are those things that will be publicly available or something that um, will be out for other states to utilize? So I definitely want to talk to my marketing colleagues about what form that might take, but you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll be reporting out to our board of directors on our strategy and it will be informed by that. Um, and if other people haven't seen it, there's some great information on the medicaid.gov slash unwinding site related to some messaging um, work that, that they've done. Um, that could be informative more broadly and kind of available right now. And Cheeky, do you happen to know uh, if that's something? Oh, go ahead. Um, possibly, I just don't know the timing yet. So we just ended those focus group discussions like over the weekend. So I don't know um, what format that will take. We will definitely be sharing that with our health insurance marketplace advisory committee right before open enrollment season starts. So of course, anything you share with our advisory committee uh, is also shared with the public. I'm happy to share those links once I have them. And of course, our public health emergency um, messaging will, will also be available to our, uh, our Medicaid redeterminations website once that's available as well. Great. Thank you. Um, and we can, um, we can be monitoring to see if those are coming out and share them out with our networks as well. Um, so another kind of group of questions we got was related to, I think, drilling a level deeper on some of the processes connecting people to marketplace coverage, in particular, affordable marketplace coverage. Um, so we got a couple of questions about really ensuring that people, like what you all can do as states to ensure people are not just transition to the marketplace, which we know is gonna come with challenges in terms of not really understanding who the marketplace is necessarily, um, not being sure about next steps, but could we talk a little bit more about um, ways to connect people to affordable coverage on the state on the exchange? And I think there was some mention of auto enrollment, um, particularly for certain groups of people. But also, I think there's an opportunity for maybe if we're not doing targeted um, auto enrollment, that there's ways to do messaging to elevate sort of different kind of plan options, uh, sharing about the differences between premiums and deductibles, so people really know what kind of decision they're making. So, can we talk a little bit more about some of those processes to connect people to affordable coverage on the exchange. So in Rhode Island, in addition to the auto enrollment um, program, for folks who are over 200%, we wanted to make sure that we are, you know, integrating our messaging with Medicaid. So we'll be using every opportunity that we can 
um, to be sharing one another's messages, whether that's through the HSRI call center, which serves both Medicaid and QHP enrollees, you know, using things like our hold um, message or outbound calls, but then also as Medicaid is communicating um, throughout the unwinding, making sure that when somebody is being terminated from the Medicaid program, there is a message about the availability of high quality affordable coverage through the exchange, the best channels for reaching out to the exchange, you know, making sure to hit home that there is affordability assistance to just create that sort of awareness bridge um, over to the exchange. And I think you're absolutely right making sure that we sort of re-engage and re-energize all of our partners, all of our call reps, all of our navigators around the differences between um, Medicaid coverage and exchange coverage will be really important, not just with respect to um, coinsurance, deductibles, premiums, but how the relationship is different too. Um, we communicate slightly in a different way or might use different strategies. There's a monthly premium. There's different ways to make your premium payment. Um, there's reconciliation, right? So we kind of need to make sure we're also getting back to basics with some of that outreach and education. So in Oregon, um, we have a no wrong door policy when it comes to our community partners or our community-based organizations. So if you are a community partner, a net navigator sister, who maybe specializes in Medicaid only, we, we ask and actually we require before you get certified in the state that you also take some form of marketplace training and then vice versa. So that, you know, who, who, the, the, the consumer, the enrollee, the enroll, whoever, wherever they go to, they will have some form of information, whether it's Medicaid or exchange. And if, for example, the community partner isn't as well versed in a specific topic, they have a partner already kind of arranged like, hey, so I'm not as good at with marketplace enrollment, I can, I can uh, recommend you to the nearest um, community partner in your area. So that's uh, one thing that we're definitely doing, aside from like what Lindsay mentioned in her state, we also partner very closely with our Medicaid um, partners for uh, communications um, streamlining and, and syncing up, if you will. Yeah. Our shared eligibility application is a great asset here, and it's actually our website is the exchange's website, so our Medicaid members are pretty familiar with us as an entity. Um, one other thing that I would highlight is um, that we developed a, what we called a get, get an estimate tool that would show um, the cost that somebody would pay in premiums with APTCs and state subsidies applied so that if somebody was with a consumer assistant and said, gee, I don't think I could afford that. Um, you know, it only takes 30 seconds and you could get a really um, good ballpark estimate of how much health insurance would actually cost for you and then see what those plan designs looks like. So um, people will obviously see those tailored to their actual circumstances um, in their own account, but it is a nice tool to let people know um, that affordable coverage is available and, and here's what it could actually look like for you. And I think that tangible example is really effective in helping people who are on the fence about enrolling. Great, and I think we might have time for maybe one more question. Um, so I'm gonna try to do maybe a, a quick question, which is uh, for those of you at the, uh, the marketplaces, um, are you aware of any other, um, I think, uh, Lindsay, you mentioned that there's a new mobile app um, that, that has been really helpful for people to use and check the status of their eligibility. Um, are there other, are other states uh, that you're aware of that have um, similar mobile apps that can make this a little easier? And I think there was also a question about how to engage stakeholders to help with con helping people con uh, update their contact information. I think the mobile uh, resources could be one really helpful tool for people out in the field to kind of be doing that on behalf of others. So if we could do maybe lightning round on, on that answer. I am aware that there are other states with mobile apps. I think um, they vary in terms of the extent of functionality. Um, so in some states you're seeing there's full functionality of a customer portal available through the mobile app. Others do um, sort of basic level of um, demographic updates and then sort of transition you over to a mobile optimized 
um, application. So um, I think it it really varies at this point across the country. Definitely, I think uh, Marissa, you mentioned the um, how many people use um, you know the online app versus um, other systems, and I think it's really important to sort of lift under the hood also to see where they who's using the apps and if there's a way to um, leverage that more knowing that a lot of people are using internet almost exclusively on their phones um, and that sort of thing. Um, so Rob, I want to um, give you a chance to sort of uh, offer some closing remarks, but I want to say thank you. This was to all of the panelists. This was a really robust and really good discussion and I'm so appreciative that you were able to, to share some of those insights and perspectives uh, and I'll give Rob maybe the last word before closing us out. Yeah, thank, thanks, Liz. You know, I would say personally, I'm I'm happy to see, you know, the country move beyond, you know, the public health emergency and I guess what you can probably call the new, 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 new normal, right? We always use that term quite often, um, but I think we still need to be careful and it's definitely still, you know, a scary thought, right? This whole very complex process that we're going to go through. I think there's a real opportunity for leaders, you know, such as those on this call to help drive, you know, change and innovation so that we can help the millions of Americans, I think that will be affected over the next six to 12 you know, months or even longer. Um, this problem is obviously very complex, very unique, but I think it presents an opportunity not to just help you know, so many people, hopefully in the short term, but also put in maybe some of these technologies and processes and tools that can be utilized from here on out as well, right? Um, especially sort of that bi-directional nature, right? This is not a problem that's gonna necessarily go away. Um, so with that said, I just wanted to take a moment to thank all of our panelists, the USF care team for, for putting this together, providing their valuable insights uh, to the topic. I know myself and, and Josh, and I'm sure everybody else on this panel are always available and eager to speak. We had a lot more questions that we'd, we could certainly reach out and talk to on one-on-one on, -on, -one on, on this particular topic. And I guess maybe my last uh, plug, Liz, if that's okay for soft down, we're going to be at the MSC conference next month for anybody that might be traveling to Charlotte uh, mid-August. I know this topic in particular, as it was even last year, is definitely going to be a central theme uh, for much of that um, conference. So we're excited to sort of continue uh, that, that conversation. Uh, I'll pass it back to you, Liz. Well, thank you um, so much for participating in this conversation. For those of you in the audience and to our panelists, I just want to reiterate what Rob said. You all are making this, uh, this really uh, problematic situation, I think a lot easier for the people who are affected. And you're really one of the, you know, thinking about this in the in a really innovative way. And it's clear that you're prioritizing the needs of people. And I um, so appreciate you both doing that work and also um, sharing that so that others in this space can can hear about ideas for what they can incorporate in their state. So um, thank you so much, everyone, and have a nice um, morning and afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.